So we could go in any number of directions and talk for hours, of course. But let me start with a question that my 11-year-old son asked me last night. Is reality there when no one is looking? Well, that's uh, pretty profound for an 11-year-old. And actually, this is part of the new systemic understanding of life that I have explored and synthesized for the last 30 or 40 years, and which I call the systems view of life. I have published several books about that, and and my grand synthesis is published in a book with that title, The Systems View of Life, co-authored with Pierluigi Luisi. So, and the two books are related because Patterns of Connection shows the evolution of my thinking over those five decades that led me to this grand synthesis. Now, to come to your uh, son's question, what uh, we have discovered is that the human mind or uh, the process of knowing, which is also known as cognition, is not a representation of an independently existing world. So if it were, then the answer to your son's question would be, if nobody is looking, reality is still there because it's, it's independent of, who, of the observer. What, what happens rather is that we bring forth a world in the process of living. So cognition is a process that is very closely associated with the uh, process of living itself. And we know that, um, for example, and, and I should say this view of cognition associates cognition or mind with all levels of life. So where, wherever there is life, we find this cognitive dimension. And we know, for example, that when we look at the tree, then we know that a bird looking at the tree will see something quite different, or an insect will see something quite different. And even um, if we say were to have a couple of glasses of whiskey and look at the tree, we would see something different because you know our mind would be influenced by the alcohol. So uh, there is an existing world out there. I'm not saying that we make it up, that we create it, but the way we divide the world into patterns and structures and parts depends on our process of observation. So we bring forth a world and if nobody were there, there, there wouldn't be, you know, objects and patterns and things that we define in the process of knowing. But this is, it's quite a complex issue. Very good. Well, thank you so much. Uh, one of the fundamental themes that pervades your thought and uh, your book is, and I'll read something to you, in order to maintain themselves effectively, living organisms must be able to discriminate between the system a self, as it were, and its environment. This is why all living organisms have a physical boundary. Uh, and that certainly makes sense in light of what you've been saying. But could one also say that about the supposedly inanimate world? Is the electron uh, have some kind of capacity to distinguish between self and other in some kind of way, obviously radically different from our own? Well, I don't, I don't know whether distinguish uh, is, is the right word, because as far as we know, there are no mental processes going on in, in electrons or, or atoms, whereas in a cell, 
linking the mental process or the cognitive process to the process of life, we can actually, you know, specify what, what is going on and how, say, a bacterium distinguishes between a greater concentration of sugar and a, a lesser concentration of sugar or, or something like this. So I, I think it, uh, for, for us to use uh, mind or cognition or anything related to it, uh, that requires a certain complexity. And what the systems view of life says is that that complexity arises with the living cell. So the, the cell is the smallest unit of a cognitive system of a living system. You discuss Hinduism and Buddhist thought uh, to a great extent in your book and uh, relate them to current scientific discoveries. Right. Yet fundamentally, one of the, the basic insights of Hinduism and Buddhism is this concept of delusion, of vidya, maya, whatever you want to call it. Right. The idea that this cognition of ours, as we cognize the world, is somehow actually simply defective. How does that integrate into your system? Well, I would, I would relate this exactly to what we were talking about before, that there, there is a material world we, we don't make it up. And there are different interpretations of Maya, whether, you know, this is made up or, or not. But uh, what I would say is that from the science point of view, uh, what we introduce is the division of reality into objects and events. And that would be the Maya. Yes, that makes sense. Yeah, I should also say maybe I should I should add that uh, regarding my collection of essays, uh, spirituality forms sort of the bookends uh, to 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 this book. To uh, mix a metaphor here, um, I begin with my interest in Eastern spirituality, which happened in the 1960s and the parallels I discovered between modern physics and the basic ideas of Eastern mysticism. And, and then spirituality is sort of always an, an underlying uh, dimension uh, to my whole work. And then at the end of the uh, collection of essays, I end with a uh, re-assessment or looking back on my view of science and spirituality. So this is a very important dimension of my work. Yes, yes, I see. Uh, and what you say makes sense that we, as it were, construct our uh, reality or reality as we understand it through our cognition. Um, but to pursue the line of thought a little further, these Eastern systems of thought say that these, that our perceptions are not only delusory, but that we can go further to a true or accurate understanding of the world that is beyond these categories called enlightenment, you know, you know all the words. Uh, how does that fit into your system? Yeah, well, what, what they are saying is that the way, the way I read, uh, you know, mystical traditions, uh, what they are saying is that we can experience a true understanding but when we express it in words, we are always limited. And you hear this again and again uh, in, in the Chinese Taoist tradition, for instance, the Tao Te Ching opens with the word, the Tao that can be expressed is not the real Tao, Tao meaning the ultimate reality here. So uh, in, in that sense, uh, this is actually the, uh, the, the very bedrock of my comparison uh, between modern physics and Eastern uh, spiritual traditions, that they are both empirical uh, disciplines based on observation, on experience, and they both say that whenever that experience is expressed in words, 
we have limitations. And the deeper we go in the nature of reality, the more severe these limitations become. Yes, uh, that that makes uh, makes sense up to a point. Uh, but one can also say that what these traditions seem to be saying is not that it's simply a matter of being uh, ineffable or unexpressible in words, but that our kind of minute to minute cognition, the way we experience the world on a day to day basis, moment to moment basis, is somehow flawed. Yeah, yeah. Well, what what happens is. Uh, from from the uh, point of view of uh, cognition in in modern science, in cognitive science, which is a whole new interdisciplinary field, is that we perceive the world in a certain way. Uh, we make up the boundaries. We make up the objects and events. And of course, we don't do this just individually, but culturally, because we are all. Uh, bound together by a linguistic tradition and a cultural tradition. So we make up these boundaries and these objects, but the reality is fluid and, and always changing. And we have the tendency to hang on to objects and to, to fixed ideas. For instance, you know, you see this in politics, in, in our political system, they argue endlessly about fixed categories and ideas in, uh, instead of realizing that the reality is, is forever changing. To me, this is the most profound insight of, of the Buddha and of the whole Buddhist tradition. Um, I see what you mean. Let me turn to a, a different question, which uh, has to do with physics. Uh, specifically particles, mm -hmm. uh, because I am my background is in the humanities. I have no scientific training yeah. per se, but as I understand it, well, at one point there were atoms that were supposedly indivisible. Right. Then, then they were divided into protons, electrons, and so on, and they were divided into still simpler particles known as hadrons, quarks, or whatever the terms are. Um, and now, uh, according to your book, uh, the latest theory is, well, what are these elementary particles composed of? Well, one theory, which you mentioned without endorsing, is string theory, that, they're, that these things are composed of vibrating springs, uh, strings in a, in a bizarre nine-dimensional space. Right. So let me, let me take this one step further. So what are these strings supposed to be made of? Are, they, are there substrings that make up the this, this, this strings? Is this going to be an infinite regress? Or are you going to end up with some fundamental particle like the indivisible atoms of Democritus? Well, uh, it seems to be an infinite regress, although um, the strings are something very abstract. They are... Uh, mathematical vibrating structures that are not material and uh, the activity, the vibration involves certain amounts, certain patterns of energy, which according to Einstein and relativity theory are equivalent to certain masses. And this is how the masses of the particles are explained. So string theory is a very a very elegant theory that, um, that says at this level of abstract strings, everything is really self-consistent and there is a fundamental vibration in the universe that creates the various patterns that then manifest as subatomic particles. It's extremely elegant and, and uh, uh, the, the problem is that it's not a proper scientific theory because it doesn't explain the observed parameters, the observed uh, the quantities in, in the subatomic world. And also there's not just one string theory, there's a whole range and you can, you can vary the parameters and you get different theories and can't decide which one is, is the one that is the most accurate. So there are tremendous problems with it, but still its elegance is compelling. And that's why most particle physicists, physicists today 
you know, are in this uh, world of uh, string theory and, and work on that. Well, thank you. That's, that's fascinating and, and very helpful. I'd like to move on to something slightly different. And this goes back to an essay that I believe was written in 1982 in your book. And in it, you say that these holistic perspectives uh, of the sort that you're talking about need to be brought into other disciplines, such as medicine, psychology, and economics. And again, speaking as a layman, I look at this and, and look at your description, and all I can say is I see nothing of anything like this in those disciplines. Medicine seems as fragmented or more fragmented than ever. Psychology has gotten, you know, basically a matter of prescribing drugs, economics, you know. Uh, so to what extent has this vision been realized? Am, am I missing something? Uh, no, I, I think... Uh... Uh, I actually address this question in the epilogue of the book, where I say, you know, here are, you know, 30 essays spanning, spanning five decades. And it is fair to ask, uh, has this paradigm shift that I analyzed and, and uh, wrote about uh, and promoted during my whole professional life, has this actually happened? And so, uh, you know, the answer I, I come to is that it is not a smooth transition. It, uh, the change has happened in various disciplines at different times. It has happened in various countries and regions of the world to different extents. And even uh, in those places, there have been backswings, there have been scientific revolutions, and I use the metaphor of a chaotic pendulum to describe this, a cultural pendulum. And I go through uh, the various phases of this uh, chaotic pendulum from the counterculture of the uh, 1960s to the New Age movement and ecology and feminist movements of the 1970s, then the uh, rise of green politics, the Gorbachev phenomenon, the end of the Cold War, the so-called peace dividend at the end of 1980s. I'm sure you remember that when we were all very excited and saying, well, now we can really change our economic system. We don't need all these military expenses. Well, of course, today the military expenses are vastly higher than, than they were then. And uh, then, you know, finally, um, the information technology revolution, the new global economics based on uh, electronic networks, uh, a new uh, uh, global capitalism, and the counter movement in the rise of a new global civil society. So the answer is not straightforward. And you can say that, yes, Medicine is still very fragmented, but on the other hand, there is a lot of a more holistic or systemic approach to health and, and health care. And uh, for instance, you know, I, I have a, a doctor, a general practitioner to whom I go regularly, and I have known him, I don't know, 20 or 30 years. And, you know, he, he prescribes uh, herbal teas to me, among other things. You know, he does a, gives me a full standard medical checkup, but then he's very preventive. And, and he actually has on his business card that he practices preventive medicine. And so that also happens. There, there are these two parallel movements and there's a huge uh, popular movement about you know healthy eating, healthy living, and so on, and uh, so it's it's not that straightforward. When you look at the academic world, for instance, uh, most of our big universities are still committed to a fragmented view and find it very hard to overcome it because the university departments are structured in that way, the scientific journals are structured in the way. 
uh, you know, the academic degrees, tenure tracks, and so on, all that is fragmented. But on the other hand, there are smaller universities and colleges, and there are pockets in larger universities where they teach a, a systemic, a more holistic view. I would also say that uh, two um, trends that are quite obvious today uh, have helped the, the breakthrough of the systemic view. One is that people realize in all fields that we live in a complex world. You don't have to convince anybody that the world is complex. Secondly, uh, people realize that networks are extremely important, uh, especially our young people who live in social networks in, in their day-to-day -day world with all the social media they have, and they live in this interconnected social, work, social world. So for them uh, to know that, that uh, social networks are important is, is, is obvious. And once you talk about complexity, and once you talk about networks, you talk about systemic thinking. So that is something I find very hopeful. Well, that's, that's, that's certainly fascinating. I mean, one area that actually seems to have retrogressed uh, in the last 40 years is psychology. And I mean this not only in terms of academic disciplines, but the mental health of Americans probably worse than it's ever been. And clinical psychology cannot be blamed for that, but it doesn't seem to be helping it very much. Uh, do you see any breakthroughs in psychology that will uh, help deal with this um, epidemic of mental illness that we have in America? Yeah, I, I actually haven't followed that. I, I heard a lecture some time ago by Dan Siegel, who is a psychologist and a neurologist in Los Angeles. And he says the same thing, what, what you just said. And he he advocates an you know an integrative vision, but I'm I haven't followed the field in in detail in recent years. Okay. One idea of mine is that psychology has probably hit uh, a wall in focusing on individual psychology, um, and it seems like there's been fairly little work done on mass psychology how people think as a mass, both as a mob in the street, uh, as a, a social network community. And it has always seemed to me that it, there needs, this needs to be understood a lot better before even individual psychology progresses. Now, naturally, this fits into um, your ideas of a systems uh, way of thinking. But I'm wondering if you have any observations along those lines. No, just uh, I, I agree with you that it's extremely important to get some clarity in, into these uh, uh, cultural and, and, and social dynamics, uh, especially in, in politics today, where we have, you know, populist uh, political leaders arising in several countries who notice the, the malaise of the population notice that people are suffering from uh, the effects of economic globalization and, and other economic issues, the, the maldistribution of wealth, the systematic shift of wealth from the poor to the rich, which, which we see in so many countries. So uh, the, a population suffering from various economic effects is very susceptible to those manipulations. And, and uh, to study those from a systemic point of view, I think, would be uh, very important. I am not aware of any such study. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another uh, question that comes up in people's minds these days um, is the real or imagined uh, revival of fascism. Now, as I understand it, you grew up in post-war Austria. Right. So you, you saw the effects of that much more immediately than, say, someone like me. Do you see fascism uh, arising again as any serious threat? 
Yes, I, I, I think this is, this is exactly what I was talking about. You know, the, the most extreme uh, version of this uh, populism is, is fascism. And, and uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, fascist elements in, uh, in uh, you know, these uh, populist politics. Radio shows of the far right are almost like the propaganda ministry that they had, uh, that the Nazis had, you know, it's, it's, it's a fascist elements. Now it's not, it's by no means as extreme. And uh, I think our democratic institutions today are much stronger than, than they were in, in Austria and in, in Germany in, in the 1930s. So I'm, I'm not worried about it, but I think that the tendency is definitely there. Well, that's, that's very good. I mean, one thing that you also, mention is this kind of chaotic pendulum. Uh, and that is a fascinating expression. And in light of all of what we've just talked about with fascism and everything, the current cultural scene seems to be more like a chaotic pendulum with all of these uh, populist and right elements that we've talked about and uh, all sorts of other um, you know, highly uh, leftist movements. So it seems to be kind of pitching back and forth between those uh, does, rather than just a swing to the right or for that matter, a swing to the left. Does that make uh, sense? Except, except when we talk about politics, I think today we have a, a very strong trend that has emerged and actually uh, two trends, I would say, focusing on, on two problems. One is uh, the climate catastrophe, the climate emergency, and the other one is economic inequality. And, 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 and the two are also linked. And so there, I, I see a very, a very interesting connection. Uh, this year marks the 10 year anniversary of the Occupy movement. And so uh, this movement of Occupy Wall Street uh, had a very creative idea of uh, pinpointing uh, social injustice and economic inequality by saying, we are the 99% and the super rich are the 1%. And they introduced this metaphor of the 1% and the 99% in the political dialogue and uh, uh, the various youth movements picked it up and got very passionate about it. And what we are seeing now, these big uh, policy packages, the infrastructure package and, and the social policies, which are the most radical social policies, they say, since the New Deal, this is a consequence of the, the Biden-Sanders coalition, which goes back to the youth movement and ultimately goes back to the Occupy movement. So to me, this is very hopeful because it shows that a, a popular movement, a grassroots movement with the right values, which is often being sort of poo-pooed as not being effective or people say Occupy has failed or has not been successful, has in fact had a tremendous influence. Well, that's a very uh, good thing to remember. And um, that really ties together a great deal of things. This in a way leads back to uh, some of what we we're talking about earlier, uh, this time though in the economic sphere, uh, you have mentioned various thinkers like E.F. Schumacher, who have attempted to integrate this kind of more holistic systems approach into economics. Uh, how do you see this pervading economic thought these days, or do you observe it at all? Well, no, I observe it a lot. And, and I, have, I, I write about economics in these essays quite a lot. And uh, what, what I see is something that is almost incomprehensible. And that is the 
persistence of economists and also of then of the corporate and political leaders we have in this illusion that unlimited economic growth is possible on a finite planet. This is just totally irrational. And yet it is pursued by almost all political corporate leaders and, and their economists. And so uh, what, uh, what needs to happen is, and what I advocate together with my colleague Hazel Henderson, is a shift from purely quantitative, undifferentiated growth to qualitative growth, because that's what happens in nature. Growth is a, an essential part of life, obviously, but in nature, not everything grows all the time. So while certain parts of an organism or an ecosystem grow, others reach maturity, decline, disintegrate, and liberate their components, which become resources for new growth. And this is what I call qualitative growth to distinguish it from the uh, GDP growth you know, promoted by our economists. This shift is also happening. There is a European organization beyond GDP and there are various other organizations that uh, promote different economic indicators, but it's still a minority view. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I, over the last couple of years, there has been a shift in corporate America, and there was this great uh, announcement made by Business Roundtable that they were, it was like an, a double page ad of the Wall Street Journal, I don't know if you saw it, that they were now going to consider stakeholders. Yes, I was very that, excited about that, but subsequently not much happened, it seems. It sort of fizzled out, didn't it? That is very close to exactly my impression. And, yeah. you know, a lot of people, even at the time, were asking, well, is this just greenwashing? And, yes, um, yes. And I believe so. Yes. Yeah. That's what okay. it was. Great. Um, let's go on to something more personal. Uh, and by that, I mean, an individual has all of these insights, uh, all of them in a wide range of fields that, uh, you know, we've discussed and that you've written about. Uh, how does a person go? How would you recommend that a person go about integrating some of these principles into their own daily lives? Well, I think the first step would be to edu educate yourself. So when you say integrating those principles into your lives, I would ask, first of all, which principles? So to educate yourselves, to really know what an ecological view means, what a systemic view means. And uh, I not only uh, have written this big 500 page uh, textbook with my colleague Pierluigi Luisi, The Systems View of Life. I also teach a course uh, which uh, about the systems view of life, which is just known as Capra course. I teach it online and I've taught it now for six years. And I have a, a, an alumni network around the world of over 2000 people. And they discuss precisely how to do this, how to integrate this into your lives. I would say the good news is, <laughs> is sort of encapsulated in the bad news because our crisis is so multifaceted that it doesn't really matter where you start. You can change your way of life, whatever you do. If, if you are a teacher, you can teach differently. If you are an architect, you can do architectural, architectural design differently. If you are a greengrocer, you can sell different kinds of fruits and, and vegetables and, you know, uh, connect with organic regenerative agriculture. So if you are a doctor, you can practice medicine different. So it doesn't really matter what activity you are involved in, what profession you are involved in. This change of paradigms from the fragmented mechanistic view to the holistic systemic view is so broad and so deep that you can just start 
anywhere. You can just start, you know, recycling, uh, uh, invigorating your local community. Uh, there are all kinds of actions. And also, I would say to people, you're not alone. There are already, you know, thousands and thousands of, of grassroots organizations that are involved in this. My colleague Paul Hawken has written a book called Blessed Unrest, where, where he um, port portrays these numerous grassroots organizations. And you can just go on the internet and type in the area you want to look at and the region you live in, and you will find an NGO pursuing precisely what you're seeking in your area. It's that widespread today. Yes. And 